I hope that what I share with you today, um, though perhaps uh, separate and somewhat apart from the work that you do at the municipal level, will generate some really good constructive interference because I've tried to kind of tease apart some of the universals that we found in, um, in, in our success and also in some of our failures. Um, the Center for Green Schools is really um, founded on the belief that every student has a right to, uh, to learn in a healthy, safe, and um, constructive environment that will support his or her learning and that every teacher has the right to teach in one of those environments and every staff person uh, the right to work in one of those. We believe that the, from the uh, kindergarten student entering the lab for the first, or entering the, the classroom for the first time to the PhD student doing research in a lab that um, everybody has, uh, will, will benefit from classrooms that are comfortable, that are, that are safe, um, and, and that ultimately are helping them to reach their goals related to learning. So, our great green school is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I, of course, am severely biased when it comes to this question. Um, but in fact, uh, we found that the green schools movement is having a really significant ripple effect um, on the education community, on families, um, and, and on the uh, communities and neighborhoods as a whole. Um, it was really the education community, though, that helped me to understand the significance of um, what our, our charge was um, via the National Green Schools Campaign. Uh, I was talking to the editor-in-chief of the American School Board Journal. His name is Glenn Cook. And you know, Glenn's job is to monitor education trends for a living. And he had invited us to contribute a regular article to the American School Board Journal. And I asked him, like, why give up so much precious space on the page to this topic? Uh, and he said, because we think that green schools are the biggest thing to happen to education since the introduction of technology to the classroom. And that was like a, that was a moment in time for me where I was like, whoa, <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? Um, because that's, a pretty, that's, a pretty, that's pretty significant, right? I mean, most of you grew up without that technology in the classroom and to think about how much different uh, education is, is today. I mean, we had like one little rickety old computer in the corner that you could like play a math muncher game on, you know, and, and, and now we're talking about them, um, students, you know, as digital natives doing, doing everything on their, on their computer and exposing them to a, a global environment. And so for better or for worse, it's had a tremendous impact on education today. And so to think that, um, that, that we were harnessing even a, a fraction of that potential is uh, a tad daunting, but also really exhilarating as well. So I want to start by talking just a little bit about where we are today, some of the current successes, and then um, really talk about how we've, we've gotten to, to where we are, and um, then open it up to talk a little bit about where we're, we're heading. Um, rather than trying to uh, impress you, I'm hoping to use you for your in, uh, infinite wisdom. I'm going to, um, for, I hope to be able to dedicate a lot of time um, uh, that is slated for this presentation to really asking of you um, what your thoughts are and how we get to the next place, um, thinking about it from the perspective of your own communities, um, but also about the lessons learned in your own careers and, um, and experiences. So, um, uh, a, a few thoughts on where we are today. Of the nation's 20 largest school districts, 80% of those school districts have said that they'll never build another school that isn't green again. Um, out of those 20 school districts, 94% of them have made that commitment in the last five years. Um, so that's something that's taken root, but it's taken root very quickly, and we're starting to see smaller school districts and, and, and independent schools uh, follow suit. Uh, when it comes to state activity, we've seen a lot that is positive. Um, 12 states plus the District of Columbia have mandated uh, green school construction. The place where we're spending most of our time and energy now is really helping those states to make progress around green operations and maintenance. That's the piece that I'm sure, as many of you know, is lagging behind. It's the retrofits, it's the energy management policies, it's the integrated pest management, green cleaning, and so forth, where there's still just a tremendous amount of work to do, or one of the places where there's a lot of work to do. We, we passed a really cool milestone recently in higher education, which is that the number of lead registered and certified projects on college and university campuses now exceeds the total number of colleges and universities in the United States. So I guess another way to think about that is we're averaging more than one lead building per uh, campus, though of course many of those campuses are disproportionately demonstrating leadership on that front. So again, a place where we have so much more to do, but indications that things are headed in the right direction. Um, 
so this is the proposition, right? 20% of America goes to K-12 school every day. When you factor in higher education, you get all the way up to 25%. So the opportunities are immense um, when you consider the fact that the leaders of the next generation are in school today, right? I mean, this is something that we've heard come up numerous times over the past couple of days. This is where we can really harness um, the energy, but also, um, uh, really raise a new generation. At USGBC, we like to call them sustainability natives, students who are fluent in the language of green. You know, they say that you're really fluent in a language and you start to dream in that language. Um, and that's the kind of, those are the kinds of students that we're starting to see come out of these environments. One of the really exciting things that we're um, starting to witness for the first time are the students who graduated uh, from green schools, green middle schools, green high schools, who then matriculate to college uh, based on that college or university's commitment to sustainability, its ability to offer them green pathways for their careers, and then ultimately choose summer internships based on um, who's going to offer them the best opportunities to delve into the issue of climate change. Um, we, we see them starting now to make greener choices about where they live after they graduate from college. They're asking questions about whether those homes or those apartments are green. So this, that seeing sort of the complete life cycle of the sustainability native is something that gives me uh, immense hope moving forward. So today, um, this evening, what I'm going to present are um, 10, 10 strategies, 10 things that uh, we've done to really accelerate the green schools movement. In fact, I think um, playing a, a pretty critical role in, in actually transforming that from a conversation from a number of sort of disparate pieces and conversations that were happening all across the country, some laudable efforts happening in many communities, but turning that into a much more unified um, movement overall. So I've listed these out um, in order one through 10, but they actually, they don't come in any particular order. I've only numbered them because uh, that mentor who I mentioned yesterday, the one who talks about highest best value, also told me that if you uh, present things in a numbered list in a presentation, everybody will take notes because they'll think that what you're saying is really important. Um, and so, so I'm hoping that being is that it is 8.30 at night, that um, in numbering these one through 10, you'll um, perk up a little bit. So here goes. Um, the first thing that we did uh, in, in advancing the Green Schools movement, we created definition where there really hadn't been definition before. So how many of you have heard of the lead rating system? And how many of you uh, either live in or work in municipalities that have adopted some sort of lead ordinance, whether it's for a public building, um, for, for permitting, and so forth? Wow. That's amazing. That's my <laughs> girlfriend calling. Um, so <coughs> um, lead really sort of paved the way for the work that we did um, related to, to green schools. Um, creating a kind of non-prescriptive definition of what it meant to be a green building. So really helping communities to have a framework um, to have that green building conversation. And in schools, that's something that was very significant because owners were typically very disengaged in the building construction process. They handed it off to the project manager who handed it off to the architect, and nobody ever had a conversation with them about what their priorities were for this educational space that was being created. And so you know, you're having uh, situations where the owner gets a choice between the green roof, owner being like the, the, um, the decision maker for the school district, the person who reports up to the superintendent, for instance. Do you want a green roof or do you want a red roof? You know, do you want the curtain wall here or do you want the curtain wall here? Not conversations that started to happen through the introduction of lead in the integrated design process about, you know, would you like to place a greater emphasis on energy efficiency or would you like to place a greater emphasis on indoor air quality? So lead in many ways sort of paved the road for us in trying to understand um, how you could create uh, a definition around the concept that you were talking about without being so restrictive that you're somehow um, eliminating creativity and, and the particular needs of individual communities. And so um, we, we did something um, uh, with, with the idea of green schools, tried to give people a sense of what a green school would look like, but without having to be overly definitive about what that really meant. And so um, this actually happened almost by accident. So a lot of things that I'm talking about, you know, hindsight is 2020. Like this is all going to sound very like clever and 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 like we knew what we were doing. But most of this we kind of made up as we went along. And this is the best example because um, this definition came about because we were writing, uh, creating a brochure for Lead for Schools. So uh, in 2007 we launched the Lead for Schools rating system designed for uh, specifically for new construction and major renovations of K-12 facilities. Um, and and that was the moment when we realized that we had a lot more to do 
and a lot more potential than just promoting a rating system, that this was a way to get communities to, that otherwise wouldn't be having green building conversations um, to have those, those conversations and to make those commitments because at the end of the day, who doesn't like a healthy, high-performing kid, right? But who really gets that excited about green office buildings. Um, so, so we were creating this brochure for Lead for Schools and we have this very wonderful graphic designer and he was saying, so we have like half a page of white space. What do you think that we should do with it? And I said, well, maybe we should like, it's schools, maybe we should do like a little play on a definition, you know, and write it out, spell it out phonetically um, and, and list the definition for a green school. And, and he said, that's, that's a great idea. Where will we find such a definition? I said. I don't really think that such a definition exists. And so I was like, okay, I was an English major. I got this. Give me 15 minutes. So I go back to my desk. I'm sort of like wordsmithing the thing and crossing things out. I, I really do think it took about 15 minutes. Um, and I brought this definition, this exact definition, back to him. And we printed it up in the brochure. And I didn't really think uh, much about it. And then um, probably about six months later, this definition started popping up like in all these articles and like blogs and you know newspapers. And it was like, the US Green Building Council says that the green school is. And you know, if I had known that that was what was going to happen, I would have totally obsessed over writing this definition. Um, and, and so it was, it was, again, one of those moments for us where we understood the significance of the work that we were trying to do and ultimately that people were going to be looking at us for that kind of definition um, and, and, and that we had to be kind of careful about what we said, I suppose. But this is also a good exercise in the need to evolve your universals and evolve what you're defining because these things are ever shifting. Um, in those days, all of four years ago, the green school conversation um, uh, was for us, at least as the U.S. Green Building Council, was much more focused on buildings and facilities. But today, for the entire community, and also for us as now the Center for Green Schools, um, it extends far beyond buildings and facilities into communities, into curriculum, and so forth. So um, we're, we're uh, open to constant evolution. And the second um, thing that, that we did um, around mobilizing green schools was established a very ambitious, very hairy mission to put ourselves out of business. Um, so the mission of the Center for Green Schools is green schools for, for everyone within this generation. When you consider the fact that there are 133,000 K-12 schools, 4,300 college and university campuses, nobody's ever been able to count the buildings. That's a pretty big undertaking. But it also, by in establishing that mission, gave something uh, for people to sink their teeth into. It gave them something to be uh, motivated and inspired around. Number three, um, maintaining a singular focus on accelerating transformation. And this, again, is something that is a legacy of USGBC. This is a, um, an evolution of a sketch that our CEO um, and President Rick Fadrizi uh, drew on a, on a, basically on a napkin um, some months before we launched the, the Center for Green Schools last year. And he said, you know, look, USGBC was created, was founded on this principle of market transformation. That's how we got where we were today. We said, what are we going to do to transform communities and buildings towards sustainability? And so that was first how we came to lead, right? We said, we need a tool. We need something that will create that definition. And so we created the lead rating system. Uh, and then we needed people who were going to advocate for and implement the rating system. So we created a professional designation. Anybody here a lead AP or a lead green associate? 160,000 approximately out there um, uh, today. And, um, uh, and so we created this, this community of people that were bound not just by sort of their mission-oriented thinking, but also um, by a professional designation. Um, and then we needed a, a place to bring all those people together. So we uh, created GreenBuild, um, our annual conference and expo. How many folks have been to GreenBuild? It's kind of a wild affair. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's big and it's overwhelming, but it's, it's the, our, our COO calls it the tent revival for, for green building. It's really quite the affair. It'll be in... Um, uh, Toronto this year in October as opposed to November like usual. Um, but Rick said that it turns out after 15 years um, we've realized that LEAD alone and what's evolved and, and uh, via LEAD, LEAD professionals, green build, really isn't enough to get us all the way there, right? It's, it's not quite enough to get us towards that ultimate finish line. And so the Center for Green Schools is the next step in that evolution. And Rick comes by this very honestly. It, um, his wife is a third grade teacher. And so I think he sees every day what the promise of educating youth is, but also the 
tremendous um, waste that, that occurs in, in schools. His wife works at um, a school in Syracuse where in the winter time it's about 90 degrees by the heater and about 20 degrees away from it. Um, and, and so um, he also, his, his wife works at a school where um, he said he walked into the nurse's office one day and um, he, he saw something from a distance. He thought that it was a piece of artwork. You know, it looked sort of abstract, modernist artwork, like all these different shapes. And, and then he got closer and he realized it was all of the inhalers of the children um, who go to that school. And so these are the kinds of things, right, that we've all experienced in some capacity in our daily lives, um, whether we have children or not, whether our, we, we um, are close to teachers or not. And this is the sort of thing that we're trying to tap into in getting people to really pay attention to a conversation about green buildings that's focused on that next generation and on students and children. So the, the next thing that we did, um, we treated special people special, right? So um, what does that mean? We, um, we, we focused on individual groups of stakeholders. When it comes to schools, stakeholders is like, who isn't a stakeholder? If you pay taxes, you're a school stakeholder, right? So that's a pretty big um, spectrum of personalities that we we're trying to appeal to. But what we did in the beginning was we really tried to like isolate um, different groups. So we, we, we met them where they were, both literally and metaphorically, and we, um, we catered to their special and, and particular needs. So um, we, we focused first on high impact audiences, um, and we made those early adopters our biggest champions. So, you know, we, we looked at mayors and we said, okay, mayors have a, a special and very particular set of needs and unique challenges and particular priorities, right? We said, um, uh, members of, of Congress, uh, they, they too have special needs, unique challenges, particular priorities. Students um, have a unique set of needs and they don't want to leave their campus and they are worried about getting a job. They had something different to contribute but also very different interests. State legislators um, had a tremendous desire to give back to their community to do something where they could really know that they had left an impact during their time in office but also were tremendously under-resourced um, in terms of trying to get their mind around what was a pretty big issue for them. Um, and, and so we, we continued to talk to, um, to various folks in a way that spoke to their priorities, their motivations, and their passions. So when we talk to mothers, we talk about asthma. We talk about their children's health. When we talk to superintendents, we talked about performance and learning outcomes. When we talk to facilities managers, we talked about the $100,000 a year that a green school can save in direct operating expenses. When we talked to school board members, we talked about legacy, you know, and, and, and legislators. We talked about legacy. What is it that you want to leave behind for your, for your children, right? With elected officials, with, with school board members, these, all these people, I mean, you are, probably could count yourself among these, these people. Like, you don't get into this job because of the money, right? You don't get into this job because it has, like, crazy perks. You get into this job because you want to actually make a difference, because you want to give back to, to your community, because, you know, something about that issue touches you, and in particular with, with people who could be defined as more generalist, in other words, not focused on sustainability, but a state legislator or a school board member who has to be focused on all these different things. They have all this noise, all these competing interests. Um, it's so easy to lose sight in the day to day of why you got involved in the first place. And so we found that in having a conversation about legacy, about why you took this job in the first place, um, and about what you wanted to be known for when you stepped down and when you left, um, that that was something that really resonated with people. So this um, is my uh, nephew, Matthias, um, and, 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 you know, it, it's so personal, right? I mean, so many of us have this image on our desks in our in our, our minds. It's it's the reason why we we do this work, um, and and also um, really good for PowerPoint presentations because uh, now you'll feel um, really endeared to me and also to my my nephew. Um, so I highly encourage that. Cute kids in presentations. My mentor, who I keep referring to, she says nothing sells like cute kids and puppies. So. I think, I'm, again, I'm biased, but I think he's about as cute as it gets. Um, we also translated the conversation, right? We put it into uh, the language of the people who we were talking um, to, and we introduced metaphors. So we said things like, lead is like a report card for your school building. Um, we said, you know that $100,000, that's enough to hire two teachers. That $100,000 is enough to purchase 200 computers. That $100,000 is enough to buy 5,000 textbooks. You know? So we translated it into terms that people could really wrap their minds around. The next thing that we did, um, based on the old saying, uh, don't, don't tell me, show me, 
um, we kind of turned that around. We said, you tell us why you think this won't work, and we'll show you why you're wrong. So, um, we, but, but I think you know, the, the crux of that, the, the center of that concept is, is um, listening. Right? It's what, what are your fears here? Like what is, what is the holdup? Help me to understand what the issue is. And so um, when, when facility manage, manager said, the biggest issue um, is that it's gonna cost us an arm and a leg. When there were people at the school board meeting in Texas standing up and saying, if y'all build that lead school, gonna cost you 40% more. That's a terrible ter Texas accent, <laughs> but you get the point. Thank you. Um, that was a conversation stopper, you know? And when the Council for Educational Facility Planners and McGraw-Hill did a study um, that, that determined, that, that found that the number one biggest barrier to more green schools was the perception, not the reality, but the perception that they cost more, we really paid attention to that and took it to heart. So we focused single-mindedly for like an entire year, I would say, maybe more, on that particular issue. And we started just like, like you know, trying to drill to the bottom of, of whether um, uh, and, and how green schools could be built without an additional premium. So this is a lead gold school. It's in Rivercrest, uh, or sorry, Hudson, Wisconsin, Rivercrest Elementary School. Really impressive energy, water, and waste savings. This is a rural community. It has no fluency in green. This is the first green building, forget lead, like the first green building ever to be constructed in this community. And by the way, Oh, there was supposed to be a cool graphic there. It was built for 29% below uh, regional construction costs um, as compared to other schools in that region that were built at the same time. And so we just sort of become collectors of those types of examples, helping people to understand through real life scenarios that, that it really isn't that impossible. Another example is um, on the existing building side, uh, when people started, when, when, when people told us that the biggest issue was that the capital budgets and the operating budgets didn't talk to one another. And I'm sure many of you have this issue as well, right? I don't pay that energy bill, I don't care. Um, we said, okay, well, take a look at Pooter School District in Fort Collins, Colorado. This is a place where when a school, often led by the students, as you see here, at the Bacon Elementary School um, uh, best team, uh, Bacon Elementary, sustainability team, best in their construction hats. Um, when those students help their school to save $10,000, those $10,000 flow right back into the classroom. So it's not impossible, it's hard, it's not what you've done in the past, but it can in fact be done, and let's figure out how we can do that, um, and let's, let's help you to talk to your peers so that they can tell you how they got that done. The next thing um, that we did was told lots of stories. We told stories tell stories over and over and over again. And we recycled um, the really good ones. And um, you know, you, it's, I think it's something really important to remember. Someone made this point earlier uh, in, the, um, in the event that uh, the narrative is really important. You know, facts are important, but so is the storyline. And um, that couldn't be more true than when we're having conversations about schools. And so um, even though uh, we think everyone must have heard this story before, even though we think that everyone must be tired of it, we continue to tell that story over and over again, and so I will do that for this particular school. Nate, my apologies, you've probably heard this story 90 times now. Um, so there is a competition that goes on uh, every year put on by the Council for Educational Facility Planners International. It's called the School Building School of the Future Design Competition. It challenges middle school students to dream big. Anything is possible. You could you know, put a, a, a swimming pool on the roof. Um, and, uh, and, and at some point a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, USGBC had the privilege and opportunity to um, host the regional uh, finals for this competition. And the first students who were up were from Montgomery County. Um, I was born and raised in Montgomery County. I went to public schools K through 12. Uh, it's got a, um, a, a relatively well-deserved reputation for being a pretty affluent county, although um, for the first time, uh, uh, ever, the county is about to be majority uh, English as a second language. So it's been through some major transitions. But it was one of the first counties in the school um, in the country, school districts in the country, to have a green building policy. Um, and and so these students came in. They had designed like the spiffiest, most tricked out green school you'd ever seen. Like we call that eco bling, right? It's you know, it's it's solar panels, it's it's living walls, it's fisheries, it's wind turbines. Like this was the greenest school. That, that you could, I mean, literally it was greener than you can imagine, that's the point. These students design things that are even beyond our wildest imagination. And next up were, um, it was, 
time for the DC public school kids to present. Um, and I'm sure all of you are familiar uh, to some extent with the reputation of DC public schools. Um, and these kids, they, they stood up um, and they said, so this is our dream school. They put the model down on the table. And the judges started to look around at each other kind of confused because the kids had designed a brick box and it had little windows and there was nothing of visual interest whatsoever. Um, and these kids stood in front of the judges and they said, this is our dream school. And what we dream of are windows that we can see through, bathrooms that work, a place where we can go to do our homework together, and two basketball hoops, or four basketball hoops instead of two, so we won't have to wait in line at recess. You know, we say that facilities don't matter. We say it's all about the teachers. It's all about the resources. Buildings are just places where we, you know, the, the, the shells that house the real learning that's going on inside. But what we don't realize, what we don't think about, is how much a child's learning environment is, an, is, is impacting that child's ability to dream of his or her future, to dream of something bigger or better. These kids could have done anything with this school, and this was their wildest dream. This was as big as they could imagine. This is the place where these kids could, went to school. So we tell these stories because we think that it's the stories that are the inspiration to act, not the intellectual, uh, intellectual agreement. There are brighter and happier stories, too, um, like the one in, in Ohio. Is the congressman still here? He's up. OK. Um, Ohio has a, a landmark commitment to, um, to green schools. Um, and some of these stories really do involve metrics and facts. So um, a couple of years ago, uh, Ohio passed a resolution through the Ohio School Facilities Commission um, that required every school to be a LEED certified school, at a minimum LEED Silver with an emphasis on striving for gold. Um, they also did something very clever at the time. They took their tobacco securitization funds and the governor cashed them in and put $4.2 billion towards the rebuilding of school facilities in Ohio, which at the time were well known as being one of the worst. Uh, they were well known for being one of the worst states in the country in terms of their, green, uh, in terms of their school facilities. Um, and of that $4.2 so Ohio started crunching some really interesting numbers on the energy savings that were going to come out of these LEED certified schools. Okay? So of the uh, $4.2 billion that they were investing over a 40-year period, and the schools are intended to and expected to last much longer than 40 years, they're predicting a savings of $1.4 billion in energy alone. And that's not even in count, accounting for a rise in energy costs, only accounting for a, a rise in inflation. Um, so just helping people to understand where this is happening, what the significance is, um, and then ultimately what the, what the dollars and cents of the conversation are too. So the next, um, I guess, secret to our success, um, and I think this one is probably the most important, uh, we don't lobby at USGBC, we partner, right? We, we learn about the priorities of the communities that we're working with. We don't preach to them. We've created chapters um, across the, the country who are part of uh, the community. We treat people as equals. We invite people to become our partners. So um, when it came to the work that we were doing around green schools, our, our guiding principle was anyone who ever had been called a keeper of the status quo was someone who we really wanted to partner with. Um, so we created this little group called the Coalition for Green Schools, and the executive committee members are listed here. So it's groups like the National PTA, the National School Boards Association, the two largest teachers unions. You're getting the point. Also some heavy hitters from uh, the environment, from school facilities. When these groups sit around the table at USGBC offices on a monthly basis, they represent more than 10 million members who have pledged collectively to work towards a goal of green schools for everyone within this generation. And in fact, we recently opened up the broader membership of the coalition and would encourage your um, organizations and or municipalities to, to sign on to that vision and let us know what you're doing. And I'll share the website with you at the end of the presentation. Um, but some really incredible things have, have happened as a result of the creation of the coalition. Um, by making these groups partners, it lit them on fire. It made them the leaders instead of the laggards. It made them the promoters instead of the safekeepers of everything that once was and used to be. And so um, 
at the, at the national level, um, these groups are doing some really incredible things. The um, American Federation of Teachers published a 50-page book on why green schools uh, are a union issue. The National Education Association uh, has a new um, a campaign called Green Across America. They have an entire section of their conference donated, uh, dedicated to sustainability issues. The National School Boards Association passed a Green Schools resolution at their annual delegation. Uh, the National PTA, the, the president um, sitting at a coalition meeting, the president of the National PTA, who by the way builds schools for a living, said, you know, I travel all over the country and I'm always seeing, you know, I'll be standing in a classroom with a principal watching a teacher deliver a lesson and a, and a two-foot chunk of plaster will fall out of the ceiling. We gotta help people to understand that this is happening. And so he dreamed up this, this idea that we would create a documentary or, or a, a film that could be aired on PBS stations across the country to really help people to understand the current state of schools and what the promise uh, was of, of greener, more sustainable practices and facilities. Um, and so that project right now is underway. And if ever, anybody has a million dollars that you wanna contribute to the project, then just come see me after the presentation. Um, but, but just incredible things that are, that are happening um, from this group of people. Similarly um, successful stories coming out of our work with state legislators. So we uh, launched an initiative called the 50 for 50 Green Schools Caucus uh, Initiative. And it basically, um, we threw 50 for 50, and Nate over here, who's gonna come up during Q&A, runs our 50 for 50 initiative. Um, we partner with state legislators across the country and we work with them to form uh, green school caucuses and working groups in their state legislatures. Um, and you know, I, I talked a little bit about uh, legacy as an issue for state legislators. The kinds of things that have come out of 50 for 50, I mean, um, I, I'm gonna botch this stat and Nate hates it when I do that, but um, in, just in the first, was it like month or month and a half of the first session, there were like eight pieces of green, don't even, I'm not gonna look at you. There are eight pieces of green school legislation or, or something like that introduced and like seven of them uh, were by members of the 50 for 50 caucus initiative. We bring them to DC every year to get together to share best practices. We've done this two, for two years now and the first year it was really interesting to see the progression. The first year, you know, we did a lot of talking at them. We did like a lot of like media trainings and you know, sort of um, drilling them on the facts, and you know, bringing in outside speakers and so forth. In the second uh, year, we planned not a dissimilar agenda, and what we found was that when they showed up, they were the experts. I mean, they had become so active on these initiatives; they didn't need us to talk at all. They had all the answers themselves. And so, what we've really done, I think, the only thing that at this point that we're doing around 50 for 50 is helping them to connect with one another and share their successes and what they're doing. So, I want to tell you um, about one of our favorite characters from 50 for 50. Meet Jim. Jim is from uh, the good old state of Kentucky. Jim is well known within his state legislature for being one of the most conservative voices. He is a member of the Tea Party. Uh, and Jim got together with Mary Lou. Mary Lou is well known for being one of the most liberal Democrats in the Kentucky legislature. And these two decided that they were going to partner together. They started talking to their colleagues about forming a Green Schools Caucus. And lo and behold, with the two of them at the helm, uh, they passed unanimously in the Kentucky House and in the Senate a resolution to establish a Green Schools Caucus um, and have done uh, amazing things in terms of getting people out to the first net zero school built in Turkey Foot, Kentucky, right? Like talk about a, if anybody can do it, you can story. Um, these are the kinds of partnerships that we're trying to forge, uh, in particular, bringing together the voices who um, are the most expected proponents and marrying them with the voices who perhaps are the least expected proponents. Next thing um, that, that we really focused on, uh, and I'm getting towards the grand finale here, um, was, was really not, not so much preaching to the choir, right? This is sort of where we are right now. It's time for us to stop preaching to the choir. It's time for us to stop talking to one another. We've worked to educate all these people, to train all of these volunteers. It's time for us to deploy those people and send them out into the world. So we've recruited them, we've trained them, and now it's really time to put them to work. Um, and so we don't lobby, we don't preach, we partner with these folks, and now we're sending them out, um, dropping champions into, into neighborhoods, um, you know, they're talking to their peer groups, they're talking to their coworkers, they're talking to their families, they're talking to their kids. Um, 
the focus for us in the coming years is really on making green schools a take-home issue. You know, how do we make this a conversation that's happening around the dinner table? How do we make this a, a household term? Um, and so what I'm going to do in just a moment is turn this around and ask you a question, ask you for some advice about how we make that box bigger because I'm pretty convinced that this isn't just about stepping outside of the box, um, but it's really about expanding the box. I think if we continue to think about this as an us and them thing, uh, we're never really gonna make a lot of progress on this issue. So how ultimately can we bring people uh, inside that, that tent? Um, and you know, how can we bring up that generation of sustainability natives, you know, students who really just inherently uh, make greener choices, who automatically divert uh, to, to, to greener choices. I, one of the best examples I ever uh, heard was a school board member in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, and she was comparing the conversation around sustainability to seatbelts. She said, you know, when, when it became a requirement for us to wear seatbelts in our cars, we always had to remind ourselves to, to, to you know, and they, they had all these very effective campaigns like click it, get a ticket or something like that. I obviously wasn't around when they made that rule. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the, she said, you know, you had to really like work to think about that. And I think the idea is that, um, you know, we're, we're trying to get to a place where that's just second nature. Um, and, and so, um, you know, the, we want more students like Charlotte, who at six years old slipped a note under her father's uh, bathroom door that said, you've exceeded the five minute shower limit. <laughs> We got to figure out how to put that to work in in the in the the, um, the prisons. Um, you know, we want more students, as I was saying, the sustainability natives who really make their choices about where they want to go to school based on what they have to offer in terms of sustainability, whether it's their buildings, infrastructure, and grounds, or um, or or the, the the majors and the and the courses that they're able to to take. So, um, this is an example of of um, uh, an initiative that we've done to try and help. Uh, students to be more educated consumers when it comes to making a choice about college. We did this because the Princeton Review published some very compelling research. They surveyed more than 15,000 college and uh, prospective college and university students um, and found that, uh, I'll give you this year's stat, 69% of prospective college students say that a school's commitment to sustainability is a major part of their decision-making process for whether or not they're going to attend. And so we worked with the Princeton Review now for the second year running to produce this guide to 311 green colleges, which is very unscientific. It's based on input from the colleges themselves, but I think that the brilliance to this guide, and this is another, like hindsight is 2020 because we like, kind of made this decision haphazardly we you know are we going to are we going to list them in order like who did it the best from you know best you know worst to to best or best to worst uh, are we just going to publish narratives and we went for the latter mostly because we didn't want to create confusion with lead but it turns out that 311 of these schools now consider themselves to be winners and so you know the social media generation within 24 hours of the new release, every single one of them has blogged about it, has done an article in their school newspaper, and so the buzz that gets generated from this and the ripple effect out into the communities. Um, a guy from Princeton Review was telling me that he was uh, at a, a school in Texas and he was driving into the campus and they had a billboard like saying like, congratulations to us, we're in the Princeton Review's Guide to Green Colleges. Um, so, Anyway, trying to um, create resources like this that ultimately help to elevate that conversation, to make it into a mainstream issue, and to tap into the energy and enthusiasm of the best advocates that we have. Um, another, another way that we're trying to expand uh, uh, that box and ultimately meet the, uh, reach the mainstream is through the Center for Green Schools Fellowship Program. So this is a program that is, um, that is based on the, the knowledge that many of your cities uh, have already acquired. Um, for those of you in higher education settings that higher education is already onto, that um, private sector is already onto, that system-wide sustainability initiatives really don't take root until you make sustainability someone's job. Somebody's gotta be there to convene the conversations. I mean, ultimately, you hope to build out a team of people, but what one person, and many of you are that one person, being the one who's approaching all the other departments, all the other stakeholders, talking to the police department, like nobody ever talked to them about their vehicles before, and those conversations are really what ultimately create the groundswell and the momentum to move these things forward. And so the Center for Green Schools Fellowship Program um, is, is based on that 
that knowledge and also the understanding that most school districts cannot afford um, to have those sustainability officers. Um, and those that can, they often get stashed in the facilities department, which of course is very limiting in terms of the types of conversations they can be engaging in. And so the fellowship program places full-time sustainability officers in school districts for three-year periods. And it's a program for transformation. We're not trying to um, create long-term dependencies with these school districts. We're trying to um, you know, go into them for a few years and leave them transformed. And so for the first two years, they report, uh, sorry, there's dual reporting to both the, uh, the center um, the USGBC and to the school district. Um, but in the third year, that person actually transitions to become a full-time member of the school district staff. Um, and, and we pay half of their salary and all of their expenses with the expectation that we'll be able to demonstrate the ROI. I mean, the actual ROI, the dollars and cents savings of that person so that ultimately they can be incorporated as a member of full-time staff. Um, our, our pilot program for the center uh, fellowship program was in New Orleans where we had someone there for uh, stationed with the recovery school district in the wake of Katrina for a two-year period. And the types of things that Anissa was able to accomplish were, and they're just mind-blowing, you know, uh, more than uh, 30 uh, lead schools that are underway and she helped to oversee that documentation. When she left, there were 10 lead green associates and, and, and two lead APs um, because she had started a staff education program. A 60 page curriculum digest that aligned existing curriculum resources for sustainability to uh, state curriculum standards. A, um, a district-wide recycling program so that the students could stop, I mean the, the, the teachers could stop hauling the recyclables uh, on their weekend time. Um, a full-time indoor air quality manager through a grant from EPA. I mean, the list goes on and on. So um, when Anissa's time in New Orleans was coming to a close and we asked her what she wanted to do next uh, as she was coming to DC, she said, I want to replicate this across the country. And so this is the program that she came up with. Um, I should also mention that we're um, uh, phase two of the fellowship program. Crud, I'm blowing all my surprises. There you are, Jonathan. I, this isn't working, it's not, it doesn't go backwards. It can only go forward. Um, I just should mention that the, the fellowship program, we're about to place our first two fellows, one in Sacramento um, and, and one in Boston. And again, as a testament to what can happen when you convene that conversation, Sacramento Unified, uh, for instance, has already mobilized millions of dollars, um, reallocated money that was, was sitting in their budget to support the sustainability initiatives. They're working on a $100 million revolving loan fund to support the school district and other districts throughout the, um, throughout the region. Um, and, and SMUD, their utility provider, provider um, came up after we announced the placement of the fellow in San Francisco and the, uh, in Sacramento and the fact that they had been awarded the fellowship uh, and said, you know, we have like $15 million lying around for residential solar that nobody's using. So we think we're just going to give that to the schools. So just amazing things through the kind of visibility that, that, um, that these types of things can, can garner. Um, just a couple of other very quick examples. This is one of the more um, recent successes and an indication that this um, uh, movement is becoming uh, more, more mainstream. The Department of Education finally um, decided to play a significant role, hopefully, in the um, Green Schools conversation, announcing, um, you see Arnie Duncan there, sort of in the, the tall guy with the blue shirt in the back, um, pretending to plant a tree with, um, with, with uh, Nancy Sutley, who's the head of uh, the White House's CEQ, Center for Environmental, Center for Environmental Quality Council, sorry, thank you. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, Lisa Jackson uh, in the foreground in her um, spring dress and shoes, um, the administrator for, for EPA, who have all um, come out and said that they're going to be collaborating on a program called Green Ribbon Schools, which is modeled on Blue Ribbon Schools. Anybody familiar with Blue Ribbon Schools? It's a, a program that, that acknowledges academic excellence in K-12 schools. It's been uh, shown to, to oh, good, has been shown to, um, improve property values and so forth. It's a totally voluntary recognition program. And Green Ribbon Schools will be modeled on that, but will be focused on themes of sustainability. Um, but the real significance we think of this, there's, there's two things. One is, I've never seen uh, a photograph, uh, let alone attend an event, where EPA, um, CEQ, and, uh, and, and Department of Education were, were all together talking about something they were going to be working on. The Department of Ed has been largely absent from the sustainability conversation historically. Um, and, and the other thing that I think is really significant is that many of the agencies and many of the associations, like USGBC, 
um, are doing a lot of things that, that connect somehow to the Green Schools dialogue, to the sustainability dialogue, but a lot of them are moving in very different directions. There's a lot of noise right now and not a lot of synchronicity, and so um, our hope is that through this voluntary program, they'll be like LEAD, you know, some sort of framework for um, the types of programs get people moving in, one, in the same direction. Um, Green My Parents is a book that we're working on to empower, uh, or a book that, that was already published that empowers uh, kids to um, go home and, and uh, green their, their houses, green their parents' lifestyles. It, rather than taking the approach like, you know, a grown up has to do this and this is a big kid's job, it says, like, you're, you know, you're a kid, you're all powerful, you have the ability to change minds, change lives. You don't need anybody's permission. You're going to go home. Here's how you strike up a deal with your parents to take a cut of the savings from the utility bill that you're going to help them to realize, and you're going to get that for your allowance. And Green My School, which is the next version of this, which will launch um, later this year, will follow a similar model. So it will say, like, you don't need the permission of your principal. You don't need the permission of a parent. It's up to you to start this movement, and you're going to go recruit people, whether it's parents, students, teachers. Um, we've also put together, I think, what is an absolutely amazing advisory board, um, and this is my opportunity to um, uh, introduce you to some of them. Um, so I'm shamelessly showing you a picture of me and Robert Redford. Um, uh, but but um, in all honesty, I mean, one of the things that we're doing through the center that really even USGBC has never done before is uh, engaging for the first time with, with celebrities, but trying to do that in a way that's really authentic, knowing that that's an important part of the mainstream conversation. That's an important, you know, when Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan are front page news, um, you know, how do we tap into that? So what we've tried to do is rather than going after the Lindsay Lohans, we're trying to go after celebrities that have a long history of being really real environmental mentalists and so um, and then we're asking them to do real work with us and so Robert Redford for instance um, uh, worked with us worked with ICLEI um, and uh, hosted something called the Greening America Schools Summit in uh, Sundance and so we invited uh, a dozen mayors and the deal was you got to come to Sundance all expenses paid it's like a super swanky place you got to hang out and rub elbows with Robert Redford but the deal was you had to bring your superintendent and so we had these three days of highly facilitated conversation about what mayors and superintendents can be doing uh, to work together and, and advance sustainability initiatives within their cities. Um, we've balanced the celebrities like um, uh, Chevy and, and Janie Chase, and, and who lives right down the street, uh, Robert Redford, Kira Sedgwick, with environmental heavy hitters and superpowers in education, so um, the biggest heavy hitter of all being Jonathan um, and you know people like David Orr and uh, Chuck Saylor's there with all the kids. He's the president of the National PTA. So that we ultimately really have a group of people that we think speaks to the broad demographic that we need to be reaching in this conversation. The last thing that we're, that we're doing, and it's, it, it probably is the most important, um, is where we are partnering and I mean that, I really do mean that. We're partnering um, with, the, with, with corporations. We're partnering with the private sector because um, you know, USGBC's uh, annual budget for the entire organization um, in the long run isn't even, even if we took all that money and put it towards green schools, wouldn't be enough for us to do what we need to do to scale the fellowship program, to scale 50 for 50 to all 50 states, to deploy USGBC student groups to um, every campus in the country. And so it's gonna take some private capital. And so we're working with foundations, but we're also working with corporations. And I think we're doing that in a way that's pretty innovative because we're not just, um, we're not just opting into their foundation dollars, but we're finding ways to, um, to, to tap into that, but simultaneously also into their marketing and PR budgets, you know, a la the American Express Members Project, you know. How can they take some credit for good things that they're helping to fund in communities? Like school districts don't care. They don't care if UTC wants to say, like, we funded a, a, a fellow. They, they want that. They want to show that businesses are investing in their community. So it's an everyone wins kind of proposition where we're able to afford school districts and colleges and universities, under-resourced schools, more resources, more funding, more support. Um, and do that in a way that in, in many ways sort of insulates them from conversations with uh, corporations that would otherwise be impossible, sort of acting as that nonprofit middleman. Um, so this is also my opportunity to express my gratitude to United Technologies, who recently came on with a multi-year, multi-million dollar commitment to the Center for Green Schools um, and, uh, and has allowed us to, to expand many of the programs I've talked to you about today. 
So I'm going to close. I'm going to turn it back around to you um, in just a moment. This is our website. It's pretty simple, centerforgreenschools.org. Um, lots of amazing resources. Many of them are applicable in a municipal context. You can download the Princeton Review Guide for free. Almost everything we have is for free. The Green Existing Schools Project Management Guide, the 50 for 50 uh, greening, green, greening our schools a state legislator's guide to best policy practices, um, and lots of other really, really helpful um, uh, tools and resources, videos, PowerPoint presentations, and so forth. Um, so this is my question to you. And um, uh, if you do a really good job, then we'll end early. Um, my question to you is, um, how do, what, what else can we be doing to, to expand the box? You know, what, what are some of your lessons learned? How, are you making this into a mainstream conversation? How are you reaching communities or, or, or people within your communities who are the least li likely suspects? How are you making this into a bipartisan conversation? Because that's the kind of wisdom that we're trying to, to, to glean um, and we'd like to learn from you today. So